Hi there, my name is Jenny Eisenminger. I'm with Houston Moms. It is our pleasure to bring informative health videos to our readers um, alongside our partners with UTMB Health. They are our preferred provider to our readers in the Bay Area, League City, Pearland, and Galveston. All of you moms there in the Southeast. This month, we are chatting about two very important topics. We'll be discussing menopause and hysterectomies. And we're joined today by one of the amazing professionals at UTMB. Here with us is Dr. Lucy Villarreal. She is a faculty member with um, UTMB in their Clear Lake and Galveston offices. She is an OBGYN, and we are so thankful for her to be joining us today. Welcome, Dr. Villarreal. Thanks for having me, Jenny. I really appreciate the opportunity. You're Let's so start. welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. Can you give us just real quickly a brief background on yourself and your practice? Sure. Um, I initially started out in academics in Oklahoma and um, moved to, to Waco, Texas, where I practiced in private practice, actually, for um, well over a decade. Um, owned my own practice, did a lot of obstetrics, and then I ended up doing a, a lot of gynecology. Um, oh, more recently, over the past uh, four to five years, I've joined UTMB in Galveston, where I actually came out of um, trained initially and met my husband um, of 31 years. And um, uh, I do have two children. One is 26 and one is 28. My 26-year-old lives up the road in the League City area, and she does environmental science and um, just finished her master's in a related topic area. Um, my son is actually at UTMB in Galveston. He is a intern in the neurosurgery department. So we are, we are big, uh, love the area and um, looking forward to uh, discussing with you um, hysterectomy and menopause today. That's wonderful. What a bunch of smarties you got over there. Love that. Um, so there's so much to cover with this topic and I think it affects all of us as women over the years in some form or fashion. So I think my first question is just what hormones are unique to us as women and how do they impact our daily lives? We are, um, it, it, from the inception, we make two, uh, three hormones actually, progesterone, estrogen, as well as testosterone. In the beginning, um, estrogen, progesterone kind of drive our menstrual cycles. And in time, uh, the lack thereof will cause us to have menopause when we no longer produce our hormones. Okay, and so we, that will fluctuate as we age. Do we make more estrogen as we age or less estrogen as we age? Like, how does that work? Good question. Um, I'm going to show you my pelvic model. Uh, <laughs> I, I told you when I love when I talk to my patients, and this is something I like everybody to understand because as we discuss things, it'll make more sense. Um, I know most of us know all the better part of this. Um, this is um, I'm going to turn it around this way. We have um, the bladder sits here. Here's our uterus. So we have a fallopian tube and an ovary. We have um, it mirrors. So we have an ovary and a fallopian tube on each side. And um, in the very beginning, when we first start having menstrual cycles, uh, we start making progesterone and estrogen kind of cyclically, which is what gets our periods going in the very beginning. As we progress in time, um, once we start having our cycles and they get more regular, we ovulate. What that means, it's kind of an open system. As my daughter asked me, is this an open system? I was like, yeah, kind of. We um, release an egg from the ovary, get a cyst on the ovary, it pops. The egg comes from the um, cyst uh, in, after it pops, goes into the fallopian tube. If we want to get pregnant, it meets the sperm in the uterus and we get pregnant. So ovulation happens, you know, the usual during the early teen years, um, we start having menstrual cycles, ovulatory cycles, of course, through reproduction, that gets important also. As time goes on, we're only born with so many eggs because uh, we don't want to have babies when we're 65. Um, to keep that from happening, we're born with so many eggs and in time we run out of them, which is why it gets a little harder to get pregnant as we roll um, from 40, 35 to 40 and certainly on 40 on. Um, sometimes requires a little bit of assistance to make sure we can drop an egg um, uh, or, or ovulate. So as time goes on, we run out of eggs altogether. When that happens, we don't make the don't have the estrogen progesterone rises anymore, and we no longer have periods at all. Thus is menopause. So to answer your question, we start out with no rises and falls 
When the ovaries decide to kick in um, during our um, adolescent years, uh, we start ovulating, having menstrual cycles, goes through the birth process. And as time ends, we end up with menopause. These kind of peter out, physically get smaller. And that's when we have menopause. Okay. There's a word that I have heard more in the last few years that I don't know if it's just because I'm, you know, approaching 40, but I hadn't heard it really before. And that's the word perimenopause. Um, and I don't feel like it's something that's been talked about much before, at least in my circles. Can you tell me a little bit about perimenopause versus menopause versus postmenopause and kind of what those stages are and maybe when we can expect you know, in a ballpark range to walk through those various stages? Sure. Um, it, it can be a little bit different for everybody, but overall, um, if, remember, we only have so many eggs to begin with. That's what girls are born with. So as time goes on, we don't have menopause overnight. We don't run out of them like this. We kind of have a progression where we start running out of them. It gets harder to get pregnant as time goes on. It gets harder to ovulate. And that was your perimenopause time, the time between when we're real regular, and then we just kind of start petering out, so to speak, where we're not dropping eggs as regularly. The hormones aren't as regular. That's going to be your perimenopause um, area. Menopause and somewhere through the 40s to 50. Average age of menopause, when you run out of the gather and those ovaries just kind of stop working, would be around 52, 54. It's going to be about an average ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, you ask also what, can, what we can expect from perimenopause. Well, when the hormones stop doing regular things, we may make more estrogen than progesterone because when we ovulate, we make progesterone largely. It makes us um, have a nice lining that subsequently sheds. If we don't ovulate, don't make that progesterone, don't have those rises anymore between 40s and 50s, we can expect heavier menstrual cycles. So how that plays out is the lining of the uterus reacts to that extra estrogen that we're making during your perimenopausal time period. And many women will experience a heavier menstrual cycle. This lining will get um, thicker um, mm. because of that estrogen acting on it without that so much progesterone. So we start having these little imbalances that'll occur through 40 to 50 as we approach the menopause. And in the end, we stop having periods altogether. Okay. And so how... Can you share with me maybe any menopause myths that you have heard, anything that you hear shared a lot that you just think it's, that's just not true? Well, one is um, if, if going through, I think myths, let's see. I think people worry about menopause being the beginning of the end, the decline, et cetera. It is probably one of the brightest periods of our life. True, um, our hormone levels have uh, have declined down to the bottom. We still make some testosterone through the 50s into the 60s. So the ovaries still produce some testosterone, allowing us to have sex drive, et cetera. Um, so I would say that uh, uh, myths would be that it's the, the the beginning of the end, you know, things get harder. Um, and, and I guess they do in certain respects. Um, so that would be pretty much what I have to, I mean, as far as myths, I can't think of any more um, things that aren't true. Um, going into the truths, things that are true is we do notice increased weight gain. I hear that all the time in my office because we're just, we don't, our metabolic rate slows down and that gets harder. And I think one of the myths there is that we can't combat that. Well, of course we can. And when we all look at each other, we all kind of smile in clinic because we know that um, if we if we're if we're honest with ourselves, our exercise habits aren't the same. Our diet habits may be a little looser. So we can tighten those things up. Exercise five times a week, thirty minutes a day. And we can work on keeping ourselves fit. So I think one myth um, would be that we can't be fit, that we can't combat weight gain, and we absolutely can. My women who are her, who are exercising regularly, watching their um, their diet, etc do stay a lot more fit and, and, and they know that as well. So we have to kind of be honest with ourselves as time goes on and we get more tired and less aggressive with our physicality. Well, and I think it, it seems like maybe we've done things one way for a while that has always worked. And then maybe now that our hormones have changed, 
we might need to adjust some of our patterns that, you know, now that things have changed a little bit and that might be a hard adjustment for some of us. But Jenny, that's so true. So I always tell everybody, if you're going to go on a cruise ship, when you were younger, you could uh, get ready for that cruise in, you know, a month, six weeks, kind of hit the, hit the gym as menopause ensues. It takes a little longer. Give yourself six months, not six weeks. So that is very true. Very true. Um, so can you also tell me, let's move a little bit into hysterectomies, just very broad scale. What is a hysterectomy and why would someone need that? Good. Hysterectomy, remember on the model, is removal of the uterus altogether. So people talk about total hysterectomy um, versus uh, um, simple hysterectomy. To us, a total hysterectomy would be removal of the whole uterus with the cervix. Now, this would be a salpingectomy. When we take out the tube, this is an oophorectomy if we take the ovaries. So we can, in effect, take the uterus itself, Jenny, without taking the fallopian tubes or ovaries um, and not affect our hormones. I just did a hysterectomy. My uterus fell out. So we take the uterus and we can take it out just like so. We can leave the ovary behind because they actually have their own blood supply. So we can kind of sever right here, leave the ovary in. And the purpose of that would be somebody who was younger, ovary still functioning, and they want that hormonal function. And they're ready to get rid of hysterectomy would be because of a lot of times bleeding um, fibroids, which are just proliferations in the, in the muscle layer of the uterus. They can get kind of large, cause irregular bleeding. Abnormalities in the lining of the uterus that make us shed and have these heavy periods we like to try medical therapies first to see if we can control that, which many times we can. Um, sometimes we can't control it with medical therapy. There are masses like uh, large fibroids, proliferations of the muscle of the uterus um, that lead us to go straight into hysterectomy, or we call it failed medical management. We've tried and it's just not working and somebody's still having a lot of bleeding, a lot of pain, et cetera. So when someone has a hysterectomy, Will that, you know, regardless of their age, like, so let's say a 35 year old woman has an issue that requires her to have a hysterectomy. Does that automatically mean that she is now in menopause? That's a great question, Jenny. And it kind of goes back to, and I hate to show this, but I'm going to, this is the total abdominal hysterectomy, which just means the cervix with the uterus. This would be a self injectomy, taking the fallopian tube and this would be an oophorectomy. Only if you remove the ovary, would you undergo menopause or if the ovaries um, stop functioning after you remove the uterus? So you can leave that ovary in. And if you do, you won't have any men uh, hormonal problems. Those ovaries are still in there, functioning fine. So you can take out the uterus, have no bleeding, leave in the ovaries and still have hormonal function, not need any hormones. And um, uh, a lot of times those ovaries function straight up into a regular menopausal time. So between 50, 54. Um, and so, yes, you can, um, all about leaving the ovary behind. And that's always the question of the day, especially as people become 48 to 52, whether they want to take the ovaries, have a little more functionality, because even when we, the ovaries peter out with menopause, remember, they still can produce some testosterone, mm -hmm. which can um, influence our sex drive. So some people like to have that advantage also. Okay. Um, and then I also wanted to ask too, are there ways, whether no matter which stage we're in, um, are there ways to manage the impacts that we feel during that stage? Is there, whether it's through diet and exercise or medications, how do you help your patients manage the impacts that we're feeling from these fluctuating hormones? Perfect. Um, so once we get, uh, officially go through menopause, whether you have, we call surgical menopause, meaning you have both ovaries removed, or if you undergo um, just natural menopause where the ovaries just peter out, um, again, somewhere 52 to 54, women start feeling, what are the signs? Mm -hmm. um, perimenopause will be the heavy periods, sometimes fatigue, start getting weight gain, um, fogginess is reported. So that's in the perimenopause that you asked about as things kind of start waxing and waning. Official menopause, those things get accentuated. Um, with surgical menopause, it can uh, feel a little more... Um, uh, on point because you've had hormones. So you go from hormones to no hormones overnight. I mm. will a lot of times offer my patients who've had a hysterectomy removal of both ovaries, uh, say an estrogen patch um, after surgery um, to keep that from happening. Hot flashes, night sweats, um, 
if you've had natural menopause, it comes on like you're saying, you get the advantage of perimenopause and it kind of creeps in. Um, so you can combat that also with um, hormones. Now, if you do not have a uterus, you don't need progesterone. You can use estrogen alone. If you have a uterus and you use estrogen alone, you will cause uterine cancer or abnormal cells in the uterus because this lining will be affected. It will get um, um, thickened and can uh, develop uterine cancer um, or atyp uh, atypical cells like hyperplasia. So if you have a uterus, you would need estrogen plus progesterone. If you don't have a uterus, you don't have to worry about the lining and you can use estrogen alone. The significance of that, Jenny, is that with um, in, our, in the study, we always go back to the Women's Health Initiative. It was the largest study, still stands today, double blind. And it told us that hormone replacement therapy, remember that is estrogen plus progesterone because you have a uterus um, with the lining you need to protect. Estrogen plus progesterone, you will have a, about an eight and 10,000 increased risk of breast cancer, um, cardiovascular incidents like um, uh, heart attack, stroke, um, and blood clots. So if you've had a hysterectomy, you actually have an advantage in menopause because you can be on estrogen alone. Mm -hmm. Estrogen alone in these studies did not show, had a hard time finding the increased risk of breast cancer, but did have the cardiovascular um, issues like uh, blood clot and stroke. Now, one other caveat is if you do not have a uterus and you can use estrogen alone, if you use a patch, it bypasses the liver, reducing your risk of um, stroke and blood clot. So again, just kind of in review, if you have a uterus and you wanna use hormone replacement therapy, you would be on estrogen plus progesterone. If you don't have a uterus, estrogen alone will be fine. And you may consider a patch to reduce your risk of stroke and blood clot. Um, there are other things we can use also, because I guess your next question will go, okay, what if I don't want those risks? I don't wanna use estrogen replacement therapy and I don't wanna use hormone replacement therapy. My women complain of sleep disturbances is one of the main problems with menopause also. Makes you feel pretty bad. I mean, try to exercise when you've had your sleep disturbed and now your, your natural weight gain is going to get accentuated even more. Um, I offer things like gabapentin um, in, in the nighttime, just kind of a 300 milligram uh, lower dose gabapentin taken at like 7 p.m. in the evening. And um, that can help sleep patterns also through the evening. You have to take it earlier. You'll be a little drowsy in the morning. It will reduce your night sweats and hot flashes and kind of give you a little bit of sleep advantage. Mm -hmm. um, there are other things like um, sometimes the SSRIs, a group of drugs that are classically used for um, depression, for instance. Now we found that some of them, one of them that I use largely, Effexor, can also help with hot flashes, night sweats, and some of the disturbances that go along with menopause also. Well, two birds with one stone a little bit there. Absolutely. So it's kind of a nice trick. There's another, um, clonidine is another medical therapy that can reduce hot flashes, night sweats, classically used as a blood pressure medicine. So its side effect can um, decrease blood pressure. So I don't use it real largely, but it, it can be an option also. Everybody should remember to layer your clothing, um, sleep with the light, light pajamas in the nighttime, watch your bedding, um, use fans and things like this, of course, would be your first step. Okay. Um, another, I probably should have asked this earlier, but I, I think one question I had too is, is there, uh, this is probably a dumb question. Is there a way to confirm that someone is actually in menopause? Like, do you get like a test to be like a, you are, or is it just like a feeling that you have, or is it like you are, is there a blood test or a, how do, how do you confirm that? Yes. That's a great question. It crossed my mind a little bit ago also, because for instance, what if you've had a hysterectomy and you still have your ovaries in and you're wondering, I'm starting to have all these hot flashes, night sweats, am I menopausal? Or if you've stopped having your periods altogether and you wonder if you're have your menopausal. In any case, um, we do make uh, hormones, uh, one's called FSH, LH, um, it comes from the pituitary. Okay, so picture this FSH, LH, um, trying to make the ovaries work, trying to make the ovaries make more estrogen. Ovaries aren't gonna make more estrogen because they're out of it, right? So this hormone level, this FSH in particular is one I like to check, will increase because it keeps trying to make the ovaries listen. So it'll go higher and higher. So I don't do a simple blood test. I can check an estradiol level and an FSH level. My estrogen level will be very low. My, F, my FSH level will be very high because it's trying to make the ovary work and it's not going to. So I can do a simple blood test. You don't even have to be fasting and um, can verify a menopausal state. 
It won't verify your perimenopausal state because the hormone levels are going to show normalness where you're going, I'm not normal. I'm telling you I'm not because the hormones are still there. The, uh, the FSH estradiol I use for people um, to verify that you are making no more hormone whatsoever. Interesting. In fact, menopausal, not perimenopause. Okay. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up today? No, I, 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 sure. I always uh, love uh, one last comment. <laughs> and in the end, uh, going through perimenopause or menopause, there are so many tools we have. Um, some perimenopausal people like, uh, for instance, a progesterone IUD to add in that extra progesterone, the periods start getting heavier. We can add estrogen in on top of that. There are so many tools that we use to help your menstrual cycles, to help your cognition, um, hot flashes, night sweats, help you sleep better. So make sure you're, you're your best proponent and that you're, you, you go in with these problems and let your physician know that this is happening. With hysterectomy, um, just be understand you know, what your procedure is. Of course, we always like to know the risk. Now you know there's the uterus being out, that's the hysterectomy versus the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. By the way, we often take out the fallopian tubes these days and leave in the ovaries because um, it may reduce our risk of ovarian cancer without removing the ovaries themselves, which of course the ovaries are the hormone producers. So just be your best proponent. When you're having symptoms or problems, do present yourself to your physician. Um, and uh, there are so many tools that we can uh, use to make your life so much better. Minimize these problems as you move through the best part of your life. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Villarreal. We really appreciate it. And um, to our viewers, we're going to drop links to UTMB Health and their OBGYN practitioners in the comments below. So if you are looking for a doctor to address concerns like this, you can easily find one at UTMB Health. And if you have any questions at all about any of the things that we discussed, you can drop those in the comments as well. And we will make sure that UTMB circles back uh, to answer those for you. As always, thank you to our partners, UTMB, for their time and expertise and the way that they take these that their time out of their busy schedules to answer our many mom questions that we have about all of these topics and, and for us to be able to share these things with our audience. So thanks for tuning in and we will see you next time with another important and timely health video and we hope that you have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jenny.